On the night of the 24th of August 2001, a fully loaded Airbus A330 with 306 people on board ran out of fuel midway over the Atlantic. How could a state-of-the-art computerized airliner suffer such a catastrophic failure? Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. Well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. We have to ditch in the water. Did you put on your life jackets right now? This, is is work. this film investigates what happened to Air Transat Flight 236. This is it. This is it's over. They're just going to die in the next five to ten minutes. And the speed's increasing, 203 knots now. It's way too fast. Everybody, I need you to brace. Oh, my God! August 23rd, 2001. Toronto International Airport is busy. Air Transat is a charter company that has grown rapidly to become one of the largest airlines in Canada. Midsummer brings fewer business travelers and a holiday atmosphere. Air Transat Flight 236 is bound for Lisbon. Most of the passengers are Canadians visiting Europe or Portuguese immigrants heading home. The plane, a twin-engined Airbus A330, is being flown by a young co-pilot, Dirk de Jaeger, and an experienced captain, Robert Pichet. The flight deck of the A330 is ultra-modern. Banks of computers connected to over 100 onboard sensors constantly monitor the operation of the plane. This film reveals how serious problems can arise when the pilots begin to distrust the computers. Before departure, the computers give no indications of any problems with the Airbus. Heavy. Follow A320 Air Canada. Turn left on Romeo and hold short on 24 right. Roger, follow A320 Air Canada, left on Romeo and hold short of 24 right. With the crew of seven, Flight 236 has 306 people on board. Transat 236 Heavy. 240 at 8, cleared for takeoff, 24 right, transat 236 heavy. At 20 minutes past 8, the Airbus A330, loaded with over 47 tons of fuel, leaves Toronto for Lisbon. V1, rotate. The weather forecast for the Atlantic crossing is good. Everything runs smoothly on the flight deck, apart from a small adjustment to the route. To avoid congestion, air traffic control directs the flight 60 miles south of its original route. It's a minor alteration, but will later play a crucial role. The passengers settle down for the long crossing. Every 30 minutes across the Atlantic, the crew check their position and fuel consumption against their flight plan. 0.2 tons on the right, 11.2 tons on the left. Despite the computerized systems, some procedures, like checking the fuel on board, still need to be done by hand. By comparing the amount of fuel in the tanks with the amount the flight started with, the pilots can keep an eye on the fuel consumption. Fuel check complete. Levels normal for the distance flown. All right. For the first five hours, everything is routine. The flight crew, Air Transat, and the accident investigators have all declined to be interviewed about what happened next. This film uses known facts about the flight, standard emergency procedures, and expert opinion to reconstruct what took place on flight 236. Look, we're getting a warning signal. Oil temp low and oil pressure high on number two. This warning is the first step in the crisis. Oil pressure is within the normal limits on number one. Number two is slightly high. 
the computer display reveals that the oil temperature is low in engine number two, but the oil pressure is high. It is a very unusual reading. The pilots are puzzled. The crew contact Air Transat's maintenance group in Montreal. Transat 236 to Mirabel operations. Mirabel Transat 236, hi. Hi, we have a little problem. We're getting the warning oil temp low and oil pressure high on the ECAM for engine number two. There's nothing in the QRH nor the FCOM. Can you help us out? I'm looking in the The ground crew have no immediate solution. The pilots must work it out for themselves. Keep monitoring your oil levels and see what happens. But because the oil readings are so unusual, the pilots believe they may indicate a computer error. The crew keep monitoring the oil levels. Air Transat 236 continues on track. Then, 20 minutes later, a new warning. Fuel imbalance warning. Haven't seen that before. Follow our weekend action. I have air traffic control. In the Airbus 330, most of the fuel is in large tanks in the wings. The computer has now detected that the fuel level on the right is significantly lower than the left. The crew consult the Airbus flight manual, which recommends they transfer fuel through a special cross-feed valve. Fuel will then flow from one tank to the other. But before opening the cross-feed, the pilots must be sure that the imbalance is not caused by a more serious problem, such as a fuel leak. Last fuel check was only 15 minutes ago and it was okay. No indication of a fuel leak. Keep going. Wing cross feed. On. On. But the situation is not correcting itself. Unknown to the pilots, there is a major fuel leak in the number two engine on the right-hand side of the plane. Flight 236 is in mid-Atlantic nearly 300 kilometers from the nearest land. Diego finds a disturbing difference. According to all the gauges, all the tanks in the right wing are way below the level they should be according to the flight plan, and, and there's hardly anything in the other ones. What about a trim tank? There's nothing there either. Yes? Hello, first officer here. Sure. Although Captain Pichet believes he is dealing with a computer problem, he nevertheless decides to ask for a visual check, just in case, to see if there could be a fuel leak. Captain? Hi. Can you and Karen uh, take some flashlights and go to the windows, if you can see anything trailing back from the wings? It'll look like a mist or a stream and report back immediately. Okay. Dirk, I want you to do another complete fuel check, please. I'm so sorry. In daylight, the fuel pouring out of the back of the wing would have been clearly visible. But in the dead of night, even with a torch, the fuel leaking from the engine is impossible to see. If the computer is correct, then with the amount of fuel remaining, right. the Airbus will no longer be able to make it to Lisbon. Captain Pichet is forced to make a crucial decision. We've got a direct. Get on to Oceanic Control, where's the nearest airfield? Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control, can you advise nearest airfield? We have a possible fuel problem.
the nearest runway is over 300 kilometers away. But with the fuel remaining, Leger's military airbase on the tiny island of Tessera in the Azores should be within reach. Santa Maria Control, transit 236 heavy. Proceed 230 flight level 390 direct. 350 miles to threshold. Are you declaring an emergency? Stand by, Santa Maria Control. Not yet. It must be the computer. Transat 236 Heavy Santa Maria Control. No assistance required yet. Flight 236 continues flying south for the next 25 minutes. Everything in the cabin seems normal. But in the cockpit, the fuel readings are getting worse. Must be the computer. I've checked. There's nothing in the trim or center tank. And the gauges show only seven and According to the fuel gauges, the plane is using fuel much faster than normal. Whether they believe the gauges or not, the captain has no choice. He must warn air traffic control. We have to declare a fuel emergency. Transat 236 Heavy, Santa Maria Control. Santa Maria Control, Transat 236 Heavy, go ahead. Transat 236 Heavy, declaring fuel emergency. I really hope it's a computer bug. Because if we land in the Azores with half a plane full of fuel, they'll crucify us. But at 6.13 a.m., less than an hour from the first fuel alarm, the right-hand engine runs out of fuel and cuts out. We're losing engine number two, I don't believe this. Okay, maximum thrust on number one. What's going on? Uh -oh. Yes. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Yes, what's on one engine, the Airbus will not fly at 39,000 feet. They must descend quickly. Try to transfer fuel from center tank and the trim tank. Transferring. Fuel quantity is reaching zero. This can't be. I'm not gonna go completely dry on this airplane. All right. We can't stay at 39,000 feet with just one engine. We'll descend to 33,000 to control our speed. 236 Delages Tower. We have lost one engine. Engine flame out. Roger, transit. On primary radar, you are at 135 nautical miles from Lajes Field. We are 135 nautical miles from Lajes Field. For the next What's 10 the minutes, the us? stricken Airbus continues on its one remaining engine. The, engine the pilots still believe that the computer may be partly faulty and that they can make it to Lajes with fuel to spare. At the end, might be all right. Fuel gauge is falling fast, though. It's, it's nearly hitting zero. But 13 minutes after the right-hand engine cut out, and with 130 kilometers still to go, the left engine begins to fail. We're losing number one. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We have lost both engines due to fuel starvation. We are gliding now. One of the most sophisticated airliners of the modern era, carrying 306 passengers and crew, is now nothing more than a giant glider, drifting steadily down towards the ocean. We have no more stabilizer. Blue and yellow hydraulic. No ADR two and three. No anti skid No reversers. Rudder trim. Radio HF one and two. Calculate how far we can go with our glide angle, will you? Well, we're now at 30,000 feet at the rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute. 
we can hang on, hang on for 14 or 15 minutes. What? I don't want to die on that honeymoon. I was just trying to calm her down, like try and reassure her that everything would be okay. It's a very big struggle um, to stay calm when you're considering your own death. Without power, the plane loses 1,000 feet in height for every five kilometers it travels forward. They can reach the Azores, but if the pilots get their calculations wrong, they may face a forced landing on the water. I'm not sure we can make it to the chest. The cabin's slowly depressurizing. We need to put our oxygen masks on. The loss of engine power means the cabin soon depressurizes. Everybody, please, I need your attention. We are preparing to ditch the plane. I need you to put on your life jackets right now. Ditching a large passenger jet on the water presents severe hazards. If the Airbus 330 has to make a forced landing, the chances of survival are bleak. In 1996, a Boeing 767 ran out of fuel off the coast of East Africa. Its last moments were caught on amateur video and reveal what happens when an airliner attempts a controlled landing on water. Of the 175 people on the Ethiopian Airways jet, only 50 survived. If Air Transat Flight 236 has to carry out a similar maneuver, it faces an equally grave outcome. With over 100 kilometers before they reach the Azores, the pilots face a long and difficult maneuver. They need to keep the plane gliding for more than 50 minutes to reach the Azores. Transat 236 Heavy to Lajes Tower. Lanchester Tower receiving Transat 236 Heavy. Do you have us on radar, Transat 236? We have you on primary radar. Confirm you're at 80 miles out. Your heading is good. Transat 236 Heavy, Lajes Tower. We are trying to make the runway. Please describe runway, heading, and length. Lajes Tower, Transat 236 Heavy. Runway is 33 and 10,865 feet long. Airport dead ahead on your present heading. Please advise when you have it in sight. Transat 236 Heavy, we cannot see the airport. We will tell you when we can. As the minutes tick by, the long wait for those on board is agonizing. On the ground, emergency services prepare for the crash landing of a fully loaded airliner. kilometers to go the crew now prepare for the most dangerous part of the operation getting their plane on the runway in one piece six heavy Delages tower do you have our distance from the threshold now and weather please Roger transat 236 heavy you are eight miles out according to primary radar airspeed 280 knots according to our readings visibility unlimited you should have the airport in sight negative Lages tower until now we cannot see the runway there is no room for error. Without power, the pilots have only one chance at landing. If they miss or overshoot the runway, the results could be catastrophic. I got it, just to the right.
Minimum rat speed is 140 knots. Maximum speed for gravity gear extension, 200 knots. I'm not lowering the gear until the last minute, okay? Okay. The crew struggled to lose height and speed for landing. Roger, Laja, six nautical miles. Let's open the slats. It'll slow us down a bit. Slats out and locked. As they approach the runway, their speed increases dangerously. Too fast and they can roll off the end of the runway. Lower the gear. Hold on. Speed is about 200. All right. I stabilize the speed. Can you give me a landing speed, please? No engine, no flaps. Ideal approach speed is 170 knots. We're too fast. Yes. But the runway is very long. Captain Pichet now performs a difficult series of swerving maneuvers to slow the plane down for landing. The crew line up the giant Airbus for final approach. Landing gear down and locked. Three green. No flaps, only the emergency brakes, no spoilers, no reverse thrust. 4,000 feet, 195 knots. Three thousand feet, 197 knots. Two thousand feet, 200 knots. Alert the cabin. Cabin crew, one minute to landing. Hang on. Vertical speed at 3,000 feet per minute. We're going way too fast. And the speed's increasing, 203 knots now. It's way too fast. 1,000 feet, 201 knots. I'm trying to get the nose up. Right fast. But even if the crew can get the Airbus on the runway, they face a further problem. Without engines, the normal procedures for braking are severely restricted. For flight 236, the danger is far from over. The pilots must land the plane without power and somehow get it to stop. hits hard at high speed. The tires have blown! Captain Pichet tries to hold the nose down. After bursting eight tires, the plane finally stops in the middle of the runway. Pichet and Diego had flown their Airbus without power further than any passenger jets in history. As news of their remarkable achievements spread around the world, they found themselves reluctant heroes. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know? That's your main goal, and uh, since we didn't have any engine, the other main goal was to make the landing safely. 
So at that time, I guess the experience came in, you know, with the help of my colleague. That's why we, that's why we made a successful landing. You train for the worst, but you never know how you'll deal, deal with uh, situations like this. And um, reflecting afterwards, I feel uh, we dealt uh, in the most professional and uh, complete wa matter we could. A feeling of being grateful to see all the passengers uh, were okay. You know, something like this happened, you never know what, what is going to happen, really. I mean, you don't, you stop not to believe it. I mean, uh, it makes no sense that a big jet with two engines has no more power with 300 people on board, you know. But although the public story was a success, disturbing questions remained. Why had a highly sophisticated airliner run out of fuel? What exactly had happened to Flight 236? Away from the cameras, an accident investigation began immediately by the Portuguese, Canadian and French transport authorities.